Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, um, it's my pleasure to be here. I want to thank um, all our sponsors and also, can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and try to share my slide. So um, my name is Dr. Fami Yiwa. I um, am the medical director of Montgomery Fertility Center, and I'm affiliated with George Washington Medical School. It's a pleasure to be here. Specifically tonight, I want to um, focus on increasing your awareness and your understanding of what we care about, the egg. It's all about the egg. It starts with the egg. So let's, let's um, define what we want to accomplish after my talk. So I'm going to take a different angle. I think my colleagues have done an excellent job um, of the treatment and, and why we're here tonight. Um, what I want you to take away from this talk when at the end of the day, understand where your eggs come from. Understand the three possible things that could happen to the egg. And then understand what we refer to as that long pause in the egg development. Um, and it is during that incredible long pause that the egg is vulnerable to damage. And that's why the egg gets older as you get older. That will give you an understanding of why we talk about the need for egg freezing. Now, the first thing I want to bring to your awareness is, I don't know if you're aware, but the uh, human egg is actually the very largest cell in the human body. It's about the diameter of, of your hair strand compared to the sperm. It's about a uh, hundred times the size of the sperm. The human egg uh, uh, originates from some precursor cells in the um, hindgut area of a growing fetus, right? It starts about two weeks post um, um, fertilization, and then it migrates to an area of where the new ovary will be, will be located. Now, another thing you should be aware is this initial cells uh, that are the precursor cells for the um, um, egg, they actually contain the full complement of DNA from mommy and daddy. And before the egg can be used, these cells are rapidly multiplied. They go from about 50 cells to about a thousand by four weeks. And guess what? They get up to 6 million of them by five months of pregnancy. That is a very, very rapid multiplication of cells. So what happens is when you have such a rapid growth, you're going to get a lot of mishaps, mistakes while this is happening. So maybe it doesn't pinch up very well. And the body's way of dealing with those accidents is to just um, clean them up. You have programmed cell death. And that occurs um, such that by the time a child is born, um, you're down to about 2 million of these cells. You've lost around 4 million cells. Now, from then on, from birth till you die, you will continue to lose these eggs. They continue to be cleaned up and die. By the time you hit menarche um, at around age 12, 15, whatever age, you're down from 2 million to about 200 to half a million cells of eggs and about um, 1,000 by menopause. Now, why do we care about this? Well, the precursor cells have the full complement of DNA from mommy and daddy. That is 23 pairs of chromosomes lined together. In order for you to create an egg that can be fertilized, you have to separate the pairs so that you create half the genomic complement that can now fertilize with um, half the genomic complement in the sperm to create a new uh, individual. Well, here's what's really interesting about nature. So we're going to pull these cells apart. We don't just pull them apart and just form two separate cells and then on downwards. Nature has a way of making sure that no two individuals are the same. It's going to shuffle the deck of cards. Like, you know, if you play cards, you shuffle it before you hand it over. Well, these DNA, they're chopped up swapped around like Lego blocks before they're ready to pull apart. If you think of how many eggs um, 
combination you can get, you can get over 8 million um, combination. You're not going to be like your sister. <laughs> so what happens is the process of pulling them apart. Now I've shown it in this diagram. It started halfway through. This process starts before you are born. At birth, it's actually frozen, right? It doesn't complete. So we can learn about cryogenics. We don't need to go to space. We can learn about cryogenics from the egg because this process is, is stopped, halted, and it doesn't resume until you ovulate at puberty. And if you don't ovulate it, it could stay there till you're menopausal. Now, the problem is, I want you to pretend you remember when we were kids and you were playing musical chairs, and then the music stops and you freeze, right? And you've got to sit down. Except instead of sitting down, you sit halfway down and then you're frozen. Well, if I freeze you for 15 years or 55 years, sooner or later, your muscles and your bones are going to start creaking and snapping and doing whatever, because you can't stay like that forever. So what happens is, if you will, the mechanism that pulls the DNA apart, these strands over here, they start to be susceptible to damage. They can break up. The, the lynch at the end here that kind of reels them in, that can also break down. The things that can break this down, what you do with what, you're, what your body is exposed to. So we talk about lifestyle, lifestyle toxins, free radicals can, um, can break down these tubules. So let me progress this so you can see what happens when you're successful. And now remember, this process doesn't complete until after birth, but it gives you an idea how delicate this genetic material is and must be separated and is, is uh, susceptible to damage. What can damage the DNA? Free radicals, right? Waste product of just being alive. Radiation, chemotherapy, cutic agents, what smoking, uh, what you expose your bodies to. And by the way, by the way, by the by, medical marijuana can also enhance this damage, um, just, just FYI. So now that we know what can damage the cells, let's go back to, we talked about the three possible things that can happen to the egg. They can stay dormant. They don't have to do anything. They can just stay in that pool of reserved cells. They can move to a temporary pool where they're half activated from which they'll be called to active duty when they become activated by the brain, or they can die. And that death, like I showed you, goes on. You lose about a thousand eggs every single month. Death is a constant. While they're in their uh, dormant state, they die. When they're being activated, they die. When they're activated, they die. They constantly will die. Um, when they are called into active duty, right? They're called in waves of cells. They don't just open the floodgate and every egg flows out. And if, by the way, if you do that, if you call off all of them to active duty, as chemotherapy can do, you open that floodgate, you will empty out the ovary of healthy cells and then you go into menopause because they're done. So some chemotherapeutic agents don't necessarily kill the DNA. Some do, but some of them just activate all of them at once and then boom, you're done. So the way you protect those patients is prevent that premature activation. So what happens when you're activated, right? The process of calling them to active duty, right? That can take over uh, 200 uh, to 300 days. It doesn't happen, snap, boom, they're ready to be divided. They have to grow supporting cells. They have to develop and grow big. Remember, they're the biggest cells. The initial stage is called the gonadotropin independent stage it takes about 150 days. They don't need the brain's help. They get up to about eight to 10 millimeters at which time they can now respond to signals from the brain. And that takes another 75 days or so prior to ovulation. So if we look at, if we look at it from, from this picture, so you have the fetal egg in the baby starts to grow, multiply, then is frozen, frozen from birth until puberty or menopause or the entire reproductive lifespan. During this frozen state, right, this cryogenic state, they are susceptible to damage and they can die. They get to a certain size. They can now be picked up by FSH. 
that Dr. Thornton had explained to you, and they can now uh, be triggered to ovulate by LH. Incidentally, they don't complete the, com the entire division until the sperm hits the outer layer of the egg is when you uh, complete that process. Why is that? Well, why activate them when there's no sperm around, right? So this other slide shows uh, the entire process from you know, young primordial pool stage, being activated over here, now being um, um, ovulated, and then they're done. Now look at this slide. What I want to impress upon you, they die every step of the way. They die while they're waiting to be activated. They die while they're being activated. They die before they, if they don't get to be the choice to ovulate. What happens is when the brain gets ready to stimulate you to ovulate, the brain is going to select what I call a basket of the partially activated eggs, right? This one's sort of in the middle. Let me put my pointer here so you can see. It's not gonna go after this ones. It's gonna select some of these partially activated ones. And, and then from that basket, it's gonna choose one to ovulate. And guess what? They're not dead yet, but hey, the brain then you know kind of tosses that basket. So each month that you ovulate, you're also tossing that basket. Now, this leads me to the topic of what then do we do when we say we're freezing our eggs? What we're doing is we're trying to recruit some, we're trying to get some of these activated eggs before they are tossed out of the basket, before they hit this ovulation stage. So the stimulation that Dr. Thornton told you about is gonna grab these cells over here, try to grow them together, and then we're going to try and collect that basket and, and save that basket. That's the process. So I'm not gonna go into the details of treatment. I think she did an, uh, an excellent job of doing that. You can go back to her slides and review it. Um, so we talk about how many eggs do you need to freeze? I'm sure you've heard this conversation. I think the most important thing out of this slide is you have to have the conversation with your doctor. Uh, when people ask me how many eggs should I freeze, I ask them, well, how many children do you want, right? So you have to think about that. If you only want one child, you don't need to freeze that many. Maybe if you're less than 35, 10 to 15 mature eggs. If you're older, you're going to need more. Well, guess what? If you um, want more children, and this slide shows why we don't always freeze everybody's eggs, um, is the number one, we talked about they're dying. They're dying every step of the way. They're susceptible to damage every step of the way. So they get, in other words, they're getting older. So in order to have the likelihood of having a child, you would need set more um, mature eggs as you get older. Well, I can tell you right now at 42, I doubt you're going to get 80 cells, really. So you really want to freeze your eggs when it's possible to get the number of eggs that you need at a younger age. And if you want more than one child, you might want to freeze more than once. So again, I hope that I have explained the complex nature of the egg. I hope you understand why the egg is susceptible to damage from the environment, from your lifestyle. And I hope you understand what it is we're doing when we're freezing the eggs, trying to save some of the eggs that have been called to active duty before they are dismissed. They never go back. They, once you're called to active duty, that's it. There's no going back. You either mature, ovulate, or you die. Thank you so much. I, I, I'm very honored to be part of this um, presentation. I want to thank all our sponsors and especially Dr. Lenzi for letting me be here.